The tragic fate of the Titanic instantly captured the public imagination in 1912, but the wreck wasn't discovered until decades after it sank. So who actually found it and how? The RMS Titanic struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic around 11.30 p.m. on April 14, 1912. The evacuation process was slow and poorly organized, meaning that many were left behind when the ship finally sank around 2.20 a.m. on April 15. Over 1,500 people died that night out of an estimated 2,240 people on board. Given all of the eyewitnesses, as well as the eventual presence of rescue ships, you'd think that it would be easy for investigators to find the wreckage, but it wasn't quite so simple. The Titanic kept drifting after transmitting its last known location, leaving investigators with a large search area that covered hundreds of miles. Finding a single ocean liner on the seafloor about 12,600 feet below the surface is no easy task, and anyone trying to recover the Titanic would have to put in some serious time, effort, and willpower to find her. Almost immediately after the Titanic sank, it seemed as if people were prepared to pull the wreck out of the Atlantic. This strange obsession didn't really dissipate as the decades wore on, either. Many wanted to figure out where the ship was and, once it had been located, raise it from the seabed. But some of those proposals were notably odd. One British company suggested filling the ship with Vaseline contained in bags and allowing the hardened petroleum jelly to float the wreck to the surface. Others thought modified ping-pong balls might work. In the more immediate aftermath of the disaster, Denver architect Charles Smith came up with an idea that involved using a submarine and a bunch of magnets. Others seemed interested in balloon-based ideas, while some suggested using liquid nitrogen. However, given that no one had even found the wreck yet, these ideas remained highly theoretical. The Titanic went undiscovered for many decades after its sinking. Ultimately, professor and oceanographer Bob Ballard was the one who, along with his team, finally located the wreck in 1985. But he didn't find it on his first go. In fact, Ballard had already attempted to find the wreck in the 70s and came up with nothing. Still, if anyone was going to find the Titanic, it would likely have been someone like Ballard. I boldly go where no one has gone before on planet Earth. He can't have a better job than that. By the 1980s, he was already a respected scientist and explorer. He had served in the Navy before taking on a job with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Research Institution. As if that weren't enough, he also earned two doctorates in marine geology and geophysics, and designed a submersible, the Alvin, which was made to take humans far beneath the surface of the ocean. Prior to his legendary discovery, Ballard had already taken part in a number of scientific expeditions. One, for example, uncovered deep sea vents and proved that life in the deep could survive without sunlight. Yet he was always focused focused on finding the Titanic, often likening the wreck's discovery to his own personal Mount Everest. The harsh reality of many scientific expeditions is the need for money. Sure, explorers and researchers have plenty of passion, education, and dedication to go around, but it's often all for naught if their wallets are empty. After all, a ship needs fuel, a crew, equipment, and any manner of other supplies ready before it can even leave port. But for Bob Ballard, his 1985 trip to find the Titanic had a somewhat surprising and secretive funder. Blame it on the Cold War. Ballard had initially been approached by the U.S. military to find the wrecks of two submarines, the Scorpion and the Thresher, which also had happened to be located in the North Atlantic. During the expedition, Ballard was technically placed back on duty as a Navy officer, though of course he wasn't able to disclose that at the time. Guess what's in the middle? The Titanic. The only reason I found it was because of that fact that there was flanked by two nuclear submarines. After finding the two nuclear vessels, he was essentially free to search for the Titanic, although he was only left with 12 days to do so. His eventual discovery of the Titanic even provided convenient cover for the mission during a tense period between US and Soviet relations. Nobody could have found a single shipwreck in the frigid waters of the North Atlantic without some assistance from technology. The group began its search with sonar. A system built by Jean-Louis Michel of the French National Institute of Oceanography was deployed to mow the lawn, meaning that the ship was tasked with making its way across the search area in regular strips, towing side-scan sonar equipment in order to get a glimpse of the ocean floor. After 31 days, they still hadn't found the Titanic, but had managed to eliminate a whopping 75% of the search area. Ballard's team then deployed an unmanned submersible with a camera known as the Argo. The group's theory relied on eyewitness accounts from the night of the sinking, which claimed the ship had broken in half as it went under. If the Titanic had indeed broken into two pieces, it would have left a considerable swath of bits and pieces scattered across the seafloor. Ballard believed that searching for the debris field would prove easier than searching for the ship itself, and it worked. After days of searching, Ballard's team found one of the Titanic's distinctive boilers lying on the seabed. The crew initially celebrated this momentous find, but then paused when they realized that it was nearly 2.20 in the morning, the same time at which the Titanic had sunk beneath the waves on April 15, 1912. Eventually, Ballard and his team also found some of the ship's hull plates. More and more detritus came into view over time, including dinnerware and furniture. Using the Argo to follow the trail of debris across the ocean floor, they eventually came across the bow of the long-lost Titanic. 
Eyewitness reports suggested that the Titanic had split in two during the sinking, but this wasn't necessarily a consensus opinion. A minority of survivors, including officers of the Titanic's White Star Line, claimed that the ship had sunk intact. However, it's possible that they were biased, since it wouldn't do the White Star Line much good to suggest that any of their other ships could have broken in half, too. Many more testimonies failed to specify exactly in what shape the Titanic had been when it finally sank beneath the water. Frank Prentice, one survivor, remembered, and all of a sudden she lifted up quickly and you could hear everything crashing through her. Everything that was movable was going through her. Given the confusing evacuation, the dark night on which it had sunk, and the trauma felt by survivors of the disaster, it's no wonder that the details became confused. The two-piece theory was finally proven by Ballard's team, as the bow and stern were clearly separated by over 1,000 feet. But how did such a large ship break into two pieces that night in 1912? Well, it's all about physics. As the bow took on water, the stern began to lift, putting pressure on the ship. The pressure on the ship's riveted hull sections eventually caused the liner to break apart into two large sections. Unsurprisingly, the Titanic wasn't in fantastic shape when Ballard found it. The ship had, after all, split into two pieces and scattered debris across the seabed. What's more, it had been sitting there for decades, accumulating mud and rust. Nevertheless, the wreck was still undeniably the Titanic. Ballard's team was even able to identify features such as the location of the ship's famed Grand Staircase. Since the ship's rediscovery, multiple expeditions have been sent out to the location of the wreckage. As the years have gone on, the deterioration of the sunken liner has continued apace. The environment has not been kind to the ship, leading to buckling roofs and the collapse of the famous crow's nest, where lookout Frederick Fleet first saw the iceberg that took down the ship. In 2019, the first man dived to the Titanic in 14 years found even more damage, with the famous captain's bathtub having already fallen through steadily weakening floors. What's more, bacteria that consume iron have produced rusticles, which, though now a visual hallmark of the wreck, are still striking evidence of the Titanic's steady deterioration. Little can really be done to halt the decay, though efforts to scan the wreck will hopefully produce 3D models that can remain long after the Titanic disappears forever. Though some prefer to call it salvage, Bob Ballard has stronger words for the idea that people might snatch up bits and pieces of the Titanic looting. Given that the wreck is the final resting place of an estimated 1,500 people, many have also concluded that salvage operations amount to little more than grave robbing. Ballard has certainly spoken of the site with the sort of reverence reserved for grave sites, once saying, It is a quiet and peaceful place, and a fitting place for the remains of this greatest of sea tragedies to rest. Forever may it remain that way. And we're just now beginning to discover the pyramids of the deep, and, and I just hope that we go through that door of technology to appreciate and not to plunder. Ballard says that he certainly understands the fascination that so many people have with the Titanic. The dream of finding and documenting the wreck is one that's been following him since he was young, after all. But in his words, it's being loved to death by visitors more than Mother Nature is attacking it. It's true that salvagers have been slowly picking apart the wreck. Some have obtained legitimate licenses to do so, while others have worked illegally. And it's very possible that, while some artifacts may have fallen deeper into the wreck as the ship deteriorates, other pieces of the Titanic's history have been plucked up by those salvagers, meaning they're now sitting in somebody's private collection. Those who are especially worried about the prospect of people picking over the Titanic's remains will be glad to know that the ship now enjoys some measure of protection. In early 2020, the United States and the United Kingdom reached a joint agreement on managing the site of the sunken ocean liner. Technically, a treaty had been agreed upon in 2003, but it was never officially ratified after Canada and France appeared to give it a cold shoulder. The U.S. was dragging its feet as well, but changed its mind in late 2019. Pre-existing UNESCO status established some rules, while the new treaty is set to expand upon some of the basic guidelines set out in 2012 by the United Nations. However, enforcing these treaties and rules gets a little tricky when you're out in the open ocean, and given how the Titanic can be vulnerable to even legitimate visitors and the forces of time and nature, it remains to be seen just how effective that protected status may be. What do you do after you accomplish one of your greatest dreams? You accomplish more. Indeed, Bob Ballard never stopped exploring, though he acknowledges that he'll probably always be remembered as one of the co-discoverers of the Titanic wreck. He believes that that is no excuse to rest on one's laurels. Not that having such a reputation is necessarily a bad thing, of course. As Ballard once told CNN, in many ways, it has sort of freed me up to dream other dreams, so I feel emancipated in many ways. In the years since his achievement, Ballard estimates that he's found about 100 shipwrecks in total. In 2019, he even put in one of the more extensive efforts to find evidence of 
Amelia Earhart's fate. Earhart, a renowned aviator, disappeared during a round-the-world flight attempt in 1937. Some believe that she may have survived a plane crash and made it to Niku Mororo Atoll. Ballard and his team weren't able to find evidence of her plane around the atoll, but it was an illuminating expedition nonetheless, using advanced sonar technology to scour the nearby ocean floor. And as Ballard reminded everyone on his team, it's worth remembering that he had missed the Titanic by a mere 500 feet in one of his earliest expeditions.